Psychoneuroimmunology uh, funding for that type of research, I think, varies hugely from country to country. In the United States, for example, there is a very good tradition of funding this work. It's been done there for at least 40 years. In the UK, and I suspect elsewhere in Europe, it's quite different. And certainly, it's the case for me that I very rarely use the word psychoneuroimmunology in my funding applications. Instead, I have to uh, focus the reviewers' minds on the role of patient factors or behavioural factors in influencing clinical outcomes. And so, uh, I tend to spin the story slightly differently in order to persuade the funders. Uh, and I think that's perhaps inevitable because we're in a, an economic climate where not all high quality research can be funded and investigators are, you know, someone like me is up against people working on the Human Genome Project. And so it's up to us to persuade our funders of the work that we're doing. And, and I think using psychoneuroimmunology makes them think of potentially work that's new age and uh, perhaps doesn't have any scientific credibility, even though that's not the case. So at this point in time, I tend not to use PNI in my grant applications, but I dress it up as something else. So the issue of getting patients engaged in research is a very important one. And my experience has been that uh, it varies considerably from population to population. Some of my earliest work was with uh, young gay men with HIV infection. And I found that it was no problem at all to persuade them of the importance of the mind in the role of the body and how emotional experiences such as stress and depression could impact on their health. Quite a different experience when you're working with older people, for example, working with patients with diabetic foot ulcers, it can be quite difficult to persuade them that something that's going on in your mind could affect your feet. And what we do is a very explicit part of our work is that we work with them to socialize them, that's the phrase that we use, to help them understand that these connections exist. Now it's not the case that you will persuade all of the people all of the time, but like any treatment, not every treatment works for everyone. And the same is true of psychological treatments. So our hope is ultimately that overall, our treatment is more beneficial than not receiving it. And that's the approach we take. So, in general, at this point, my work has uh, shown two main things. It's shown that psychological factors appear to play a role in vulnerability to disease, so in other words, who get sick, and also in the progression of diseases such as diabetic foot ulcers, HIV infection, etc. The new emerging area in my field and also in my own research is to really try and harness that evidence and to say, can we develop interventions which can improve these outcomes? So that, I think, is the next frontier for this area of science and also for healthcare.